Gig Gab, the Working Musicians Podcast, episode 189 for Wednesday, November 14th, 2018. Greetings, folks, and welcome to Gig Gab, the podcast by, for, and about working musicians. As usual, I am here, back here in Durham, New Hampshire, Dave Hamilton. Out here in Las Gatas, California, it's Paul Kent. How are you doing on this wonderful hmm, Wednesday, my friend? I'm doing good, man. We're a little late this week because <laughs> I was on a really cool trip. Went to go check out Nashville. That, I, so that's a music town. I've never I've I've driven through there, but I cannot say that I've been there. So tell me about this. What what it was really cool. From, yeah, from your from an outsider standpoint, what was it like? Yeah. Well, you know, I live in Silicon Valley, so pretty much everyone you meet here is in the tech industry in some way or another. You know, overwhelmingly, it's it is incredibly common right. to find people with a startup or you know, like like that's the conversation. If you're in LA, you find people in the in the entertainment industry. That's what's down there. Totally. You know, that that's what defines it. Certainly in so Nashville. That's where I was last week. It's funny you mentioned that. But yeah, and I ran there into exactly that. So yeah, Nashville. Yeah. Yeah. So you know, the first place we went for dinner, our our waitress said, our server said you know, I'm in the, I'm here to get in the music industry, our, our Uber driver, I'm here to get in the music industry. So yeah, it's a music town. Um, it was really cool. Uh, the main touristy drag, uh, Broadway has about a hundred bars and live music on a Monday, Tuesday morning starts at 11 in the morning and all the bars, uh, you know, they, they pipe the music out onto the street to co- try and grab you as you walk by. So right. it is all, all, all about live music. Um, you know, like there's Sixth the Street touristy areas, which Sixth is a lot of covered stuff. Austin. Yeah. It, it, similar That's thing. what I understand. I've never been there but yeah. right here. Yeah. Very cool, um, man. Huh. The players were great. I mean, I'm amazed the singers were just fantastic. I mean, everything from, you know, bluegrass, pure, you know, classic country, a lot of a lot of classic rock covers going on, but the players were all rock solid. I understand. I got a note that uh, a lot of these players are playing for tips only in a lot of these places, which is an amazing thing. And in fact, our Uber driver said, yeah, I think that those touristy bars even, and they're all real nice. They're huge bars with huge stages, really nice sound systems. I mean, it's, it's really, it's not like divey. It's, it's like a really comfortable place and they're trying to attract, you know, people of all ages to come in to enjoy the music. So it makes sense that it's like that. But, um, I was just real impressed with the, you know, the quality of the players and made me, you know, inspired, you know, to go do what I do. It made me think about my local scene here, you know, what the differences are. Um, yeah, it was a very, very cool place. It was a great experience, beautiful town, good, good things to eat. And like I said, live music everywhere you turn. It was great. So that that's interesting because when we had Buddy Gibbons on, who actually I had wound up having dinner with uh, when I was in L.A. Uh, a week ago, Monday. And he came from Nashville. He, well, I mean, he didn't come from Nashville. I think he came from Mississippi, but he lived in Nashville, worked in Nashville as a, as a drummer, musician, composer for a while, and then moved to L.A. And he told us that story. And part of that story was that he said there were, you know, a lot of people in Nashville that were willing to take gigs for cheap. And and he found that, you know, he would be better off in L.A. with a higher caliber of player that also was, you know, actually out there to make money. So that's interesting that that, you know, he, I mean, he was he was talking at a very high level that people were willing to work for cheap. But it seems like that trickles right down to the bars where people are just working for tips. I hope they're making yeah, my, I hope they're making something. Yeah, it seemed OK. I mean, like I said, our last Uber driver, he was a producer and he was you know under 30 and he said he was a producer. And he goes, you know, there's that that touristy cover scene but you know all those guys have another angle and they're all you know that they're doing that for some side money or because they just love to play or you know whatever it is but you know that's and i asked them you know do do the original artists look look down on the guys and no it's not so much that they look down on it but that path to success is really fraught like there's top level players that came to town and tried to go that path and they'll make 30 bucks in a night on tips and you know 
if you're a drummer, that means almost by definition, you're going to have a band around you. If you're a solo acoustic guitar player, piano player, you might be able to do a solo gig and that's okay. But, you know, to come and be a sideman gig, you know, it's, it's tough to make any money. There were people throwing money in and, you know, I think, I think it was just part of it. And I could see, you know, certainly on a good night. I mean, it was freezing cold and, and, uh, oh, yeah, but there was yeah. still a lot of people there. It was a week before, you know, it was a couple of days leading up to the CMAs, the country music award. So that, you know, the, the town was starting to buzz again by the time I left. Um, sure. I, to me, you know, buddy's story is a little bit about supply and demand, right? I mean, clearly there's a ton of players and the bars can provide a stage and an audience. And, you know, it's just one step up from busking. And there's no lack of players want to take that thing. There was a whole other side to the scene of original artists, you know, trying to make it big. And I would guess every one of these artists that I saw probably had an angle to that. And this is what they were choosing to put some food on the table, you know, as that path. But, you know, there's, you know, the, the, you know, the Bluebird and, and uh, Third and Lindsay, like where Vince Gill and the Time Jumpers have their sitting Monday night, you know, go see Vince Gill sitting in and playing, you know, jam bluegrass. I mean, there was, there's that aspect to it too, which is pretty incredible. So um, it's just a lot of music and, and like anything, when there's a lot, you know, there's a lot of paths to success and there's a lot of um, there's a lot of funk that you got to cut through to get to that when there's a lot. And that's kind of, you know, it's the same as someone walking into L.A. saying they want to be an actor. Right. There's plenty of places where you could, you know, act for free and someone else will make a dollar off of you. Yes. Um, right. So yes. it's just anything else. <laughs> that's a fair point. Yep. Yep. But Crazy. Nice to see that much live music. It was really, yeah, really invigorating that, and that's, good, good players. That's the thing I, I, one of the things I really liked about Austin was that same kind of thing was, you know, there's just so many people that are so passionate about playing music and that it's infectious it, in, a, in a very that's good way. Good word. Yep. Very good way. Yeah. That's awesome. That's good. Ah, I'm glad. So. Yeah. I got to go there at some point. I actually have a really good friend that lives there and I've never, I mean, I, again, I've sort of been through and visited him, but not, not what you got to experience, which is. Well, it was interesting how it was different from New Orleans. So I spent a little time in New Orleans last year and that is, um, uh, I'm certainly a music town and that's a large part about the brass band culture. That's a bigger thing and jazz, right. Um, and New Orleans jazz, you know, there is bourbon street and there are, you know, rock cover clubs that are touristy type things. Um, uh, that those certainly exist as well, but this was um, a little bit more about um, uh, music industry and a, and you know critical mass of producers and record labels and you know people looking to find business deal. I didn't that didn't strike me as much as New Orleans. Certainly, like I said, awesome brass band musicians everywhere you turn, sure. and great and great jazz musicians everywhere you turn. But it, it was it was it was more that in New Orleans and more business a path towards business. It seemed in Nashville. Mm, interesting. Yeah. That makes sense. That makes sense. So, yeah, but I'm, I have a, a, a solo acoustic gig on Friday and a band gig on Saturday and it just definitely got my juices going. I'm ready to, I'm ready to jump in, got some good ideas. And again, you know, seeing a guy with really good vocal chops and, and guitar playing chops playing at two 30 in the afternoon in a, in a one third full gigantic cavernous bar doing his thing. And, you know, knowing that he's a professional, not knowing who would walk in at any minute, seeing how he talked to the crowd, see how, seeing how he managed um, requests, um, seeing, you know, how he chose to weave his originals into a set, seeing how he mm. chose to play some stuff familiarly and some stuff where he put his own clever spin on it. I mean, there's, there's definitely, a, a, it was a good learning experience as well. Uh, yeah. I, right. It's always, it, it's always a pleasure to watch someone at, at their craft, especially, you know, f- for those of us that do this, right. You know, we, it, for better and for worse, we cannot go and watch live music and and see it as a non-musician or a non-performing musician, right? There's always going to be moments, or at least I'm speaking for myself, there's always going to be moments where you're looking at it like, oh, that's interesting. Like the way that, you know, that person or that band is handling this situation or that situation or crafting their set, the arc of the their performance and all of that. And it, it really is a pleasure to watch somebody that, that does it, you know, perhaps five times a week. And you can see they're just like part of it's autopilot, part of it's just, you know, muddle through. And then part of it's this yeah. like, oh, yeah, oh, they've learned some tricks there. And you can sometimes tricks. pick up on those. Right. You, you know, like just tricks to tricks to success. I was thinking a lot 
earlier this week about, you know, there's that and it happens all the time, sometimes things that are our fault and sometimes things that are not. But, you know, when you're when you're on stage and something is going wrong, right? Like maybe the monitor cuts out or somebody's playing out of tune, right? Or somebody, you know, blew through a, uh, you know, a, a stop or something like things that just aren't, you know, aren't right. And I, for me, I, um, you know, I'm a, I'm a pretty emotive guy and I know that that betrays me sometimes, especially in those moments. Like I know, oh crap, my face is probably communicating something <laughs> about this thing. Telegraphing. Yes. Telegraphing. Exactly. <laughs> yes. Great word. And, and so I, you know, I try to be aware of that. And as soon as I catch myself in that mode, like, Oh crap, look at somebody in the crowd and smile, right? Like this is the most important thing you can do right now. Whatever's going wrong. If you could fix it, you already would have, you know, you like whatever it is, you got to get to the end of the song. Yeah. Sometimes the end of the set, maybe like you just got to deal. And and it's that. Oh, yeah. Let's put on a smile. Let's move around a little bit. Let's perform. Let's put on a show, even though something about this at the moment is non optimal, you know, and that it's such a hard thing. Like I would love for my automatic reaction to be like when something goes wrong, to be to smile and like move through it. That is not me. So yeah. I have to make it as automatic as possible. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah I think that, you, you know, we're talking about those prof professionals in Nashville. And I think that there is a, um, there's a spectrum, right? So mm -hmm. there's the people who are, are set in the perspective that my authenticity is part of my vibe is part of what I'm delivering as a musician. And so, you know, reacting to the real, um, uh, elements around me as something goes on is that's part of part of the performance. Deal. That's right. I guess, you know, I think, uh, yeah, I, I think guess. that's okay. Right. To a degree, to a degree. Right. And yeah. to a degree. And, it, and where it falls apart is, um, when it's negative, right? So, you know, what could be so terrible on stage? I mean, if someone's playing woefully out of tune, I guess that, that, that would be pretty bad, right? If right. You know, someone hits a wrong note, you know, maybe someone forgets some words. Okay. You, you know, but really, um, it's not that bad. That's, and that's yeah, I, the thing. Most of the time, yeah. it's just not that bad. Yeah. 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 That's the issue is it's too easy to get caught up in, how bad is this really? And and in the moment, it can seem very, you know, like I'm I'm an impatient person. So when something distracts me, I, I get upset about it, you know, and it's like, oh, yeah. But you know what? Really like this. This isn't worth ruining the performance over. Uh, let's just have fun. It This reminds yeah. me. Um, I don't I, I, I hope this is true. And if you fo if anybody out there or Paul, if you know this not to be true, please don't tell me because I, I, I've lived with this for a long time. <laughs> this is a truth in, in the mind of Dave. But years ago, a, uh, a dentist told me I was doing work on his computer because that's a thing I've done. You know, I've had a consulting business or whatever. And I was working on his computer and something didn't go right. And I'm like, oh, crap. And he looked at me and he's like, oh, what happened? I'm like, uh, it's nothing. I'll figure it out. You know, and he's like, oh, no, 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 no. You let me know there was something wrong. Like, now you got to tell me. And I had known this guy and and he, you know, we, we had that kind of relationship. I was like, oh, yeah, you know, I, I screwed this up and I got now I got to fix it. And I, Don't worry, I won't bill you. It won't take very long. You know, whatever. I just I took the wrong path down a, you know, down a, a problem solving thing or whatever. And yeah. uh, he said, yeah, you know, in dental school, you said, you said, oh, crap, or whatever you said. He says, you know what they teach us in dental school to say when uh, when we make a mistake? I said, no. He says, do you want to know? And I said, yeah. He said, rinse. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. He just changed my whole dental experience from now on. No. <laughs> yep. He said, rinse is what we say anytime we make a mistake. And you are so conditioned to it by the time you leave dental school that it's just what you do. So there is How something to be said for, the, like, I want to apply the rinse lesson to the stage, right? I want to, yeah. I want, when something goes wrong, I just want it to be smiles, all good. <laughs> or keep something. Keep it rinsed. <laughs> that? Keep it rinsed. That's true. Keep it rinsed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If you see us, if you come see me play and you hear me say rinse, you rinse. know. <laughs> 
Yeah. yeah I, I think this, it is the rare guy who, um, it is the rare guy who is, uh, such a, enig- uh, the enigmatic qualities of his personality are marketable. Right. You understand what I'm trying right. to say? Yes, you we talked the rare about this guy. before. You yeah. can raise your eyebrow or, you know, shake your head or do something like that and have it be useful for you or your band. It is the extremely as a, rare As a guy. performance element. Yes. 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 Correct. Yes. Correct. Um, you yeah, know, well, you know, Noel Gallagher or Liam Gallagher, right? Like those Gallagher brothers, that's part of their performance was the fact that they would get pissed about things, you know, and that worked for him. It also worked yes. for uh, Roger Daltrey in The Who. Like people would go to see him get pissed about something. Right. That worked for him. Guess what? Right. Probably doesn't work for you. It certainly right, right, doesn't right, right. work for me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I, I think in general, when we're talking about that spectrum of performing, so there's the people who are great performers focused on the audience. And, and I think, you know, we're talking about, you know, going to school, go watch sidemen because a front man has to be on, right? So they have little wiggle room to be ineffective. Watch sidemen, you know, and from sidemen, you find out who's, who's, who's emitting a joy from getting off on what his bandmates are doing. And, you know, who goes inward when it's his turn time to shine, you know, Find the people that you like and watch Simon really carefully. Again, I, it's going to be a rare person who, uh, and, and so often that enigmatic quality is someone's inexperience or, or even worse, discomfort with performing. It's right. kind of their go-to. Oh, these guys, you know, I can't believe they're doing this to me. You know that 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 kind of tone and that kind of look, I think, is. Um, is, is an attempt to cover up an, an own personal insecurity. And if that's you, that's not a cool thing. Right. I, I mean, you, you, I just mean, you know. No, I, I know what you mean. Yeah. 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 It's funny. <laughs> Rinse. There you go. Rinse. Yeah. 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 So um, let's see. I um, I have a an acoustic. We had a, we had a, a, a band gig uh, last week at a regular at a regular gig of ours, and I think I was telling you about this one. We um, have played there for years. Um, we were paid pretty poorly for years. We got up to marginally respectable, and now we're ready to get this place up to our you know respectable. And and sure. the the background to this is, um, in the winter time when we don't fit in too many places, we have three or four clubs that we kind of you know keep us busy, and and it, and usually get two or three of them every month through the winter. And then when we hit our summer gigs, is when we're playing quite a bit. Sure. So this place is in a we built up an audience there. The guy who owns the club does well. You know, it's fun for us to play. We usually have a good time there, and we've been killing it for a long time. Two times ago, so not this past week, but a month ago or six weeks ago when we were there last. Um, was the first time we had a really average night in a long time, mm. long time. And so it was not the night to ask for a raise. Right. Yeah. Uh, and then we came back and, uh, and then the, the gig that we just had was another great gig. And now, now we're ready to ask, you know, sure. and bring it up. And, um, y- you know, we always talk about leverage on this show and this, it's a perfect example. I like the gig and I want to keep the gig. I think the guy is making a lot of money off of it. And so it should be a very easy business conversation. I'm going to ask for X. He's going to, in his head, know what he charges at the door, know how much of the door pays us, know how much he makes more when we're there. Yeah. He, yeah, he, he knows if he can, if he can raise the price at the door. I mean, all this type of stuff. So I think it's a pretty, it's a pretty good, pretty good situation, you know, to go in. But um, yeah, we had one night where it just wasn't the right night to push, to push the conversation. So Absolutely. I let, let it go, came back, you know, kicked butt and, you know, everything's good now. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. It's um, it's kind of like I, I was telling you, we had to sort of re uh, repave the path with the folks at the Stone Church uh, where we do all our fling fest because ownership had changed and not just ownership, but the entire sort of management structure had changed. And yet they inherited this relationship and the sort of the time that we were in there where it was would have been right to pay, you know, to talk about the the following year and all that was the wrong night. We, we knew it was the wrong night, just timing wise. Sure. And, uh, but it was, I mean, timing wise, it was the wrong night 
and we knew we weren't going to bring a crowd in there like we usually do. We did okay, but it wasn't great. It was like, oh yeah, I don't know. This is gonna, this is not going to end well, <laughs> you know. Yeah. And sure enough, like three days later, we get a call like, hey, about that next date we have. It's like, okay, let's go talk. And we did. And and then you, you know the next one we was a date we had picked for these fling fests. The 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 date really matters in terms of how it fits into the the sort of the the social schedule of our our community here. Because uh-huh. what we're doing is pulling a lot of people that have, you know, like school age kids. And, and so there's a lot of things that get in the way of that. And the one that, that didn't do well, they had moved us to a date that conflicted with school graduation. It was like, yeah, right. This is not going to go well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but, you know, we showed them. We're like, oh, no, look. Yeah. This was a night we picked. And look at this. They're like, you did amazing. We're like, yeah. <laughs> like, well, it's not amazing. It's what we expected. It's it's how this usually works. And like, right. Oh, so we really do need to talk to you. We can't just move your dates around. I'm like, oh, you can do whatever you want. <laughs> it's your bar. And I and it is important, like when you're in that negotiation with, process with people, it is important, like it, at times, because I can get a little pushy or whatever. And we sure. weren't getting pushy, but they were, I could feel that, that the person we were talking to, that she started to like, you know, I don't want to say defensive was the right, that it's defensive is the wrong word, but she started, it was obvious she was starting to get into a point where she was acting like she had to, to acquiesce to us. And I was like, no, 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 no. This is, mm. you're going to regret that if you choose that. I don't want you to regret what we're choosing to do here. This is your bar. Like this, your, this is your club. You, you have to do what works for you and what works for you may not be the thing that worked for the previous people. So let us know what you need. And we're here to, we know what, what works for us. So let's do it together. And that actually went really well. It did, oh, that's you know, cool. like, oh, right. We are working together. It's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. We're not here to dictate. We're just here to tell you, we know what we know. You, you know what you know. Let's right. put it all together. Like it's all okay. Doesn't a negotiation does not have to be a zero sum game. Like everyone can. No, but you have to have two willing participants. You have to have two willing participants. Absolutely. Of course. And that's what I actually find often with clubs is it's one willing participant. Like, you know, Mm. our good ideas or let's partner or let's this type of stuff. Yes. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a one way conversation. Yeah. That doesn't work. I mean, it, it, it can, but it, but again, then you wind up with that zero sum game where in order for someone to win, the other person has to lose. And right. it's like that. This is look, you know, no, <laughs> I don't I don't believe in that. That's not that's not how it has yep. to be. You know, you know. Yeah. Hey, we got um, we got a couple of emails from from two different mics. I, I, I swear two different mics. Uh, one of them, uh, the first mic wrote in uh, something we'll call a cool stuff found. He found a device called the Clang K-L-A-N-G, Paul. He says Mm -hmm. it is used, as he writes, it is used to widen the spatialization in your in-ear monitors. He says, I heard this device at AES a few weeks ago, and it works pretty well. Basically, it uses each channel of audio going into the console, i.e. lead vocal, guitar, drums, etc., and gives it a separate control in the system. Each of these channels, he says, you can then move to wherever you want them to sit in your audio field. So it's beyond stereo. He says you can move the channels to the left, right, in front, behind, and everything in between. He says it might be stupid expensive, he says, but it's super cool. And he says the next thing the company is working on is to put localization devices on your ears so that the program can know which way you're facing and move the channels accordingly. And so that it's natural. And if you look over at the, you know, the stage right guitar player, you hear more of that person, you know, which I mean, I love that. I, you know, I'm a geek, right? So I like technology, but I really like um, this, <laughs> this clang. I mean, it's essentially 3D in ear mixes, right? And, and yeah. look, we laugh about it, but if we were, were to rewind 20, 25, certainly 30 years, you know, to when I started playing, if you said to me, hey, someday you'll be able to have uh, this, uh, you'll be able to plug headphones in, like these tiny little headphones that are custom fit to your ears, and then you'll have this this magical uh, device that's, you know, about the size of a piece of bread that you could keep in your pocket and wirelessly control exactly what you hear in your ears. I would have laughed at that. Like that's like beyond Star Trek, right? But in fact, yeah. that's exactly what we have today. So, right. like, so this thing, like, you know, yeah, I'm sure it's expensive. I didn't even look at what the price is, but, um, but that's pretty. The cool. other reason I'm I'm guffawing at this is because you know, 
I, I'm still struggling with my in ears as is. Oh. To add another layer of technology. Right? Fair. Let's, let's make it even more complicated. <laughs> fair, <laughs> fair. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, uh, so thank you, Mike. We we really appreciate any of the uh, feedback that you folks send in. Of course, to feedback at giggabpodcast dot com. And then uh, the second question that we have from the second Mike, and I'll put a link to this Clang thing, by the way, in. Uh, in, in the show notes at giggabpodcast.com, of course. Uh, the second note that we had is from uh, also a different Mike. And he said, uh, we had a, lot, a discussion last night at band practice of moving everyone to in-ear monitors in the band and uh, a possible upgrade to allow us to control our monitor mixes, right? So describing, you know, the 30 year ago scenario that's actually reality today. He says, can you tell me the name of the board that you guys see all the time that works well? So there's lots of them, right? But um, but there's a couple we've talked about on the show. The sort of the main, the one that's become very popular, and I, I don't want to call it the industry standard, but it's it's certainly it, the 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 most popular one I run into out there in terms of digital boards is the Behringer or Midas um, 32 series. It's the X32 series from Behringer, the M32 series from Midas. They are effectively the same they are f functionally almost the same board the, the Midas has different mic preamps and and slightly different routing flexibility but for the most part they're the same the apps for them work with each other so if you don't like the way the Midas app looks you can actually download the Behringer app and use it with the Midas board it doesn't matter but that's that's the most uh, popular one the most common one i see the one that we run in Fling is the Mackie uh, DL series. We have the DL1608, which was the first of those. That's only a 16-channel board, but it works really well for us in Fling. And uh, I I find it a little easier to manage than the than the Behringer. The Behringer is really nice because it's super flexible. You can do pretty much anything with it. And because of that, you can get yourself into trouble if you sort of route yourself into oblivion and get no sound um, but, uh, but the, the, the Mackie works really well and, uh, super smooth and, uh, you know, it's, it's such a pleasure to be able to have, you know, so many outbound mixes for in ears. It's a, it's a yeah. pleasure to, to be able to have like compression. I, I would, I mean, it, you know, again, rewinding 30 years to when I started playing live, the idea of being able to run compression on every vocal mic was insane. You have an hour to set up. There's not going to happen. Right. But when you can tweak that board ahead of time and save those settings, so you know, okay, it's, you know, Paul is always going to be singing into that same microphone. So I can set a compressor. That's just going to be for you on that mic and you're good to go. Like we, we don't even have to do anything. You just recall it and you're done. So right. <clears throat> that, that kind of thing, it, it, it really, if you're not on a digital board yet, Check out one of these two. You use a different one. You use the PreSonus. Is that right, Paul? We do, but we're ready to move, actually, uh -huh. okay. for a few different reasons. One is PreSonus has been good, um, but we the ability for us to walk into so many other situations with a with a, a zip drive and, and just plug in our scenes and that type of thing yeah. seems to be just – it is it is the killer app, right? You know, right. to have that kind of consistency. And we've also had like, you know, the fader stop working on the personas and oh. now we're having some jack problems. So there's there's a couple of weird things oh. going on. So yeah. what are you uh what are you gonna move to? Do you do you have probably the Midas? Yeah, okay. Yep. 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 The, the, so here's the thing about the Midas that drives me and, and any of these that drive me crazy. The uh the the but the Behringer and the Midas allow you to also add, you can have 32 channels maximum, uh, but you can add a stage box and, and it connects with essentially ethernet cable. Somebody's going to be hand wavy about it, but it's ethernet cable, right? So it's beautiful. You can put this box on the stage. You can have all your outputs on that. You can have, you know, all or most of your inputs on that. And then instead of having a snake running back to where the soundboard's going to be, you run one piece of ethernet cable and you're done, right? It's great. Here's the crazy part. We, we, this is how it works for us in Uptown Celebration, right? Everything plugs into the stage box, the mains, the monitors, all the microphones, all of the, uh, you know, all the monitors, all, my in-ears, everybody's in-ears. Well, actually, several people are running in-ears, but any, everything. The only thing plugged into the actual main board that you also have to buy is an Ethernet cable and power. It has a bunch of inputs and outputs on it that we don't use. It's just a mixer. 
And it's crazy that they have not yet. They do sell a rack only version of the, I think the Behringer. I don't think there's a the Midas rack only, but there might be. Uh, but it would be great if they sold a control surface that was just a control surface and didn't have all the preamps and everything in it. If you're not going to use them, but, and you can do it with an iPad, but of course, you know, a lot of sound engineers really want to have, you know, a wider surface with real faders and all that. And it's right. just kind of nuts that, that, that doesn't exist yet. It's sort of frustrating that you're buying all this stuff that you are definitely not going to use, <laughs> but, but in the end it works out really well. So I, yeah. yeah, 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 cool. yeah, we have anything else, man. No, I think we're good. All right. Easy one today. We're we're getting into the holidays. I'll have some good gigs this weekend and I'll bring some good stuff in. But uh, yeah, all good, man. Cool. Yeah, we've got a um, we're doing uh, our own event uh, again at this place called Sue's Place in in Rochester, New Hampshire, where we uh, we essentially four wall the event in a in a, you know, in a in a room. And we did one of those. I think I talked about it. We did one of them. We did an all originals night there back. I think back in March or something. And that worked out, actually worked out really well. Better better than I expected, I must admit. And oh, so, cool. yep. So this weekend we're doing that same thing again. On, uh, not not the same thing, same place. Uh, on Saturday, we've got a different band with us this time. Our friends uh, in a band called Sea Rock are playing with us. And um, I'm just going to have a blast. And I think it'll, it's fun when you're in control of the, 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 the whole thing, as opposed to, you know, um, playing on someone else's schedule and the way a club needs to work for their clientele. If you can bring your own clientele to, a, you know, to a room and go play, that's, that, it's actually pretty cool. So. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Have a good one. What's that? Have a good one. Thanks, man. I, I, I wasn't sure if you were asking a question or just saying a, a nice thing. So there you go. Just wishing you well. Thanks, my friend. Uh, folks, thanks for listening. Thanks for sending in your uh, your questions and your cool stuff found and all that stuff. Feedback at giggappodcast.com. What is the thing that we like to say, Mr. Kent? Always, especially in Nashville, <laughs> be performing. Always. <laughs> <laughs>